Uh, let's jump into the, the text tonight. We're going to be looking at the vision of prophet Isaiah, among other things. But not only. We'll start with the God-seer's quest for the face of God. As we see in, in Exodus 33, uh, this is one of the many manifestations of the fleshless or asarcos logos in the Old Testament. And we're looking now uh, at this particular aspect, the God-seer's quest for the face of God. Last time, three weeks ago, when we were last here, we looked at the uh, burning yet unconsumed bush of which Moses uh, was the witness and spoke to God through and in it. And so now we're looking at his quest for seeing the face of God. The church gave the prophet, prophet Moses the title God-seer. And rightly so, since while to the other prophets, God spoke in a vision or in a dream, to Moses the Lord spoke, quote, face to face, as a man speaks to his friend in Exodus 33, 11. Although we had, he had seen and spoken with God so many times, now he asked to see the face of God. Show me thyself visibly that I might see, I may see thee. His request transcended human limits, since as God said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me in my full glory and live. Nevertheless, he showed him a part of himself, his quote-unquote back parts. These are very uh, important phrases uh, that the Holy Fathers, as you'll see, interpret uh, to, under to be... Uh, uh, to, to, to lend to our greater understanding of the essence and energies of God, the, the, that which is totally off limits and that which is manifest, uh, the theology or the, the life of the Trinity, which is totally unknown, and yet that which is manifest in the economy of salvation, all of this is extremely important, uh, not an accident that St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote a whole treatise on the life of Moses uh, because it is so instructive for uh, our understanding indeed of the theof theof the theophanias the theophanies rather of the old and new testament in this simple yet majestic biblical narrative the holy fathers being themselves also god seers discern the face that is the essence of god from the back parts of god that is from his energies all right so they see in this simple yet profound description that we're talking here, and the, the, the way they, they explain it, understand it, is that no one can see his face. In other words, no one can see his essence. And yet he shows his energies, his operations, his divine grace. While the essence of God is unapproachable and imparticipable, imparti imparticipable I guess that's the best way to pronounce it, the vision, theoria, the vision of God is given to the pure by the uncreated energies, so that they see the glory of God, the uncreated light. The sight of the uncreated light is dangerous to those not pure, lest the, at the sight they should lose their very lives, as it says uh, in, let me see if we have that. Actually, in this first section, we don't have all of the uh, patristic um, authors on the page, on the screen. And so for that, I apologize. But right here, we're talking about, um, and this is the Idiomelon from the uh, Vespers of the 6th of August. Uh, that's what that's quoting right there. And it's also uh, um, uh, in the liturgical uh, life of the church here, uh, showing forth the theology of the church as is meat. The Holy Father explained this theophany and exactly... Uh, and exactly what Moses uh, saw. Moses, being a God-loving man, longed for God and did not know, of course, that he was longing for the impossible. For he had seen him in the bush, he had seen him in Mount Sinai, he had also seen him appearing in various places and with a different appearance. But that blessed Moses longed to see his face. Being a man... He had a human conception of the power that transcends this world. God accepted the longing of his faithful servant. So what does he tell him? No man that will see my face will live. 
the mortal face cannot bear the immortal hypostases. So this also helps uh, and just points to one of the reasons why we have anthropomorphic language, right? Moses, being a man, had a human conception of the power that transcends this world. And so in, the, in order to be able to communicate properly, oftentimes we have this anthropomorphic uh, language that as if God, the eternal God, the invisible God, the immortal God has a limitations like a human face. But he speaks in this way so that we might understand uh, and and not be not be left in the dark. And so here Moses will see what is possible for man to see, and that is the divine energies. Nevertheless, he adds, I place you on this rock and I cover you with my hand, should be hand, and as my glory will be passing by, you will see my back parts, but my front part you will not see. To prosopo, that's what the Greek word for face is, front part, right? To prosopo. Uh, and so uh, he cannot see that which is of his essence. He did not, uh, as I am passing by, but he did not say, rather, as I am passing by, but as my glory is passing by. As my glory is passing by, idoxa. And this is often referred to and used interchangeably with the divine energies of God, the grace of God. Since it is impossible for anyone to go beyond the glory and to find the existence of God. It is impossible for man to go beyond. Let me actually get the Greek in front of me here. Just a moment. Uh, is impossible. 107. Is impossible for someone to go beyond the glory, the indoxa, and to find the existence. Navritin iparxi. Iparxi is existence in Greek. Existence, the very existence of God, which is beyond. Moses found nothing beyond the glory. And even this he did not see fully. This is how God presents himself, not proportionally to the dignity that befits him, but proportionally to the strength of those who will enjoy his sight. That bears repeating very important, very important interpretive key for all of our understandings. This is what's lacking so often among the heterodox, especially among the Reformed Protestants, but also the increasingly the papal Protestants and others who are not well versed, and many Orthodox who are now are not paying attention and not well versed. That these distinctions, these keys, the interpretive keys are missing, and therefore we misunderstand scripture. So this is very important. Let's repeat it. This is how God presents himself, not proportionally to the dignity that fits him. In other words, that's not the problem. It's not on his side, it's on our side, proportionally to the strength of those who will enjoy his sight. So people say, where is God? Where is God? Well, according to your strength of faith, of love, of desire, eros for God, you see God. If you don't see God, it's not God that is hiding. In other words, avoiding you. He's everywhere present and fills all things. He's constantly revealing and wanting his creation to be in communion with him. So arrogantly man stands and says that terrible phrase, where is God? Or why don't I see God? Or I don't believe, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that we see oftentimes under our comments on the on this channel from the atheists and the unbelievers and the others who are skeptics. Uh, and in their great arrogance, they don't see. If we have humility, we understand that it's according to the strength of our, or rather our weakness, that we enjoy his sight, his presence. And that's for our benefit, for our salvation. The God that speaks on, mount, on the God-trodden mountain Sinai and shows his glory to Moses in the word. This is the God. Shows his glory to Moses in the word. Saint Cyril of Jerusalem accepts this as well. He says, he that in olden times spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai, mount, the mountain of Sinai in a manner befitting God, later when he took on flesh, fulfills the law, subjecting himself to the law like a servant. So he, St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century identifies he that in olden times spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. The same 
the one and same logos, fulfills the law, said bring himself to the law like a servant, identifying the two as his meat. So he that conversed with Moses in the ancient times with symbols on Mount Sinai was the same Lord that showed his glory also on Mount Tabor to his three disciples in his transfiguration. Christ, who revealed the uncreated glory or kingdom, Vasilia, of the Father as his own natural glory in his transfiguration, is the same Lord of glory in the Old Testament. Now, however, he is repeating these same appearances as through his human nature. Very, very interesting and helpful. Identifying the exact, the, the showing forth, and that already with Moses, the kind of experience that we will see uh, is foreshadowed, uh, that we will see with the apostles on Mount Tabor is foreshadowed. Of course, here now we have his human nature, which is, of course, the salvation of mankind. Uh, Pay attention here, he says, revealed the uncritical glory or kingdom. Now, in, in contemporary, uh, uh, the contemporary world, but also for hundreds of years, especially in English, the English language, I think uh, more, perhaps in all the Western languages, kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. For many people, maybe, not all, but for many people, this is a very, uh, gives a very um, easily misunderstood uh, impression that what the, what's what's being spoken of here is an external, political, social, earthly, worldly reality. Of course, that's the great temptation and trap that the Jews fell into when they were expecting a worldly savior, a worldly uh, uh, figure who would who would give them power over the Romans and all throughout the world. And they're still looking for such a Messiah. Uh, they think of the kingdom of God as something very fleshly, very worldly, very temporal. And that's not at all, of course, what we're talking about. So the uncreated glory or vasilia of the Father, kingdom of the Father, that is what the kingdom is. The reign or the rule of God is a spiritual reality. It is an internal reality. Where is the kingdom of God? Within us. That is. That's when the uncreated glory, the presence of God, the divine energies of God, the grace of God comes and dwells in us, abides in us, purifies us, cleanses us, enlightens us, deifies us. This is the vasilia, the kingdom that God has come to bring, right? So Christ who revealed the uncreated glory, or vasilia, so identifying kingdom and the uncreated glory, of the Father as his own natural glory in his transfiguration. is the same Lord of glory in the Old Testament. Now he is repeating these same appearances of his through his human nature. Uh, so transfigurate, the, amount of, the amount of transfiguration gives a very different understanding than most people under, uh, today would, would probably uh, first assume. Uh, we're not going to get into, a, unfortunately, a exegesis of the scriptural passage describing what happened on Mount Tabor, but you can already see uh, how important this is to understand. In light of Christ, right? Christ interprets the Old Testament. It's in and through Christ. He is the Logos that's speaking. And so therefore, only through Christ can one understand the Old Testament, only in and through Christ, and therefore only in and through the church and in and through the experience of the deified in the church. Otherwise, you cannot understand the Old Testament. Now we're going to go to this second section of the four that we're looking at tonight, and we're looking at the lawgiver, the lawgiver. And this is a miniature of a beautiful icon of the prophet Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, the law from the hands of God. During his people's journey through the desert, once he had prepared them, God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments, the tablets of the law, and made an agreement that is a testament with his people. He then made the testament and gave the law was God the word. He gave the law to Moses as uh, Father John Romanides says in his book, uh, Christ the, the uh, Life of the World. There on flaming Sinai, out of heaven the voice of the Lord was heard. And the trembling Israelites heard his words out of the midst 
of the fire. They heard the voice of the Lord who was speaking to them, but they saw no similitude of God. Yet when the God-man was speaking of God, the Father to the Jews, he assured them that ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Doubtless, since it was not God the Father that spoke at that time, then it was his Son, who appeared as an angel of the Lord, angel of great counsel, and conversed with the God-seers of the Old Testament. So here we have another very important connection between the Old and the New, and we see through Gospel of John how we understand the Theophanias of the Old Testament and how we understand the phrases here of our Lord himself, ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor, nor seen his shape. And yet, we know that his divine energies, his backside, his divine presence is seen and felt and experienced and lived by the deified. Uh, and it is with the logos that they are uh, speaking and communing. St. John Chrysostom considers that the Maccabees, who suffered for the sake of the law, suffered for the sake of Christ, since he is the lawgiver of the Old Testament, he says. The only begotten Son of God was the God of Jacob. He both gave the law and worked all the miracles for them. So St. John Chrysostom witnessing again to the Asarchos Logos, Christ, uh, the fleshless Logos, is the same, one and the same, who gave, uh, and the Maccabees were serving. There's no dichotomy here. What tremendously delusional heresies existed and still exist today in some minds uh, in the ancient church with the, with the uh, various Gnostics who denied the God of the Old Testament as being the same and one God uh, if, of the New Covenant. In his homily on the Mount, the Lord completes and perfects the law of Sinai, but he does not say that he himself had been the lawgiver thereof. The reason is because they would not have accepted him as the lawgiver of the Old Testament, since they would not have been able to comprehend his pre-existence. When he told them once that he was older than Abraham, they wished to stone him. If he had told them that he was the one that gave the law to Moses, what would they have done? That is why he spoke neither of himself nor of his father and simply said, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time. Of course, he did not say by whom this was said, yet by his deeds he showed that it was he himself. For the one that completes what was imperfect in the law is he that instituted it from the beginning. And that is... Um, St. John Chrysostom uh, about the one of essence, speaking about the one of essence, his, his 10th uh, lecture. It's not a, number of, a number of sections here from St. John Chrysostom. So this also shows forth the, 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 wisdom and the discernment of the Lord in the New Testament when he's speaking to the Jews. Again, like unto Moses and those in the Old Testament, according to the strength or weakness of their receptivity, he speaks to them. Remember that? Remember that? When we blame the Lord, blaspheme in the Lord for his limitations, supposed limitations, or his uh, the great scandal that many will uh, fall into in the end times will be this idea of God's abandonment, supposedly, of mankind. The God abandons, right? Uh, not understanding that it's we who first uh, walked away, that he is constantly present, and he manifested and came to us when we were still sinners and still in darkness. He who the prophet Isaiah saw in his vision, sitting on a high and exalted throne, with the seraphim standing around about him, each one having six wings, and who cleansed him from his sins and sent him to preach to the people, is the only begotten Son. So now we're moving into this vision of the prophet Isaiah. 
this amazing vision that we read about in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah. The evangelist John explains this very clearly. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him in John 12, 41. So very clearly, St. John, the theologian and evangelist, says clearly that the vision of the prophet Isaiah is a vision none, of none other than the Logos who became flesh. And Isaiah spoke of him. So the, the apostles, even though they did not hear the Lord preaching this to the Jews, they understood very well that the Logos was the one who appeared to them, the same one who spoke to Moses, the one who spoke to all the prophets. They understood the what many heretics, including some in the West who were not heretics but can, were confused in the early centuries, they did not understand that there was the Logos throughout the Old Testament. That is a major problem a major oversight, and still is very present. I've been actually, uh, in my research and presenting this paper, this uh, these uh, talks, uh, I haven't had much time, unfortunately, because we're doing multiple things every week, but I did try to search around a little bit of the internet and see what's going on in terms of the discussion. And it's interesting that I do see a discussion going on pretty regularly uh, among various pundits and Orthodox and Roman Catholic, and this does seem to be uh, a major division point between Orthodox and contemporary apologists for Catholicism. They do not understand. They don't. They don't uh, embrace this, uh, and it's uh, very revealing. Uh, very revealing. And they're not getting it from their own theologians in the West, and they're not being raised on it. And this is why this this course and these particular first ten weeks or so are so important. And you'll see them. Maybe not now. Maybe you can't realize as you hear all this, but it will come back to you again and again when you encounter various heretical ideas uh, and you'll say, well, wait a minute, that's the logos that you're uh, misunderstanding here. You're not understanding the presence of God throughout the whole economy of salvation. So uh, right now you can go and watch uh, just this last week, I think Jay Dyer and others were, he was countering various apologists from uh, Catholicism and he was talking about these very points that we're talking about right now. And the Holy Fathers agreed, now talking again about the vision of prophet Isaiah, who you see on the left here, this icon from Mount Athos, I think. And the Holy Fathers agree that he who, had, who was seen by Isaiah is the Son and Logos. No one should doubt at all that it was the Son that the prophet saw in the glory of God the Father. For the Apostle John writes very clearly about him, the Son and Logos. This is St. Cyril of Alexandria that we're quoting here. Let me just... Take a one moment. I want to make sure. Um, I think it would be maybe advantageous here. One nineteen to put on the screen. Yeah. Okay. We'll just uh, we'll go on. We'll leave that. Something I would, we'll leave for. <laughs> The publication of the book. The vision refers to the Savior, the Son of God, according to St. Procopius of Gaza. He who is referred to throughout the entire prophecy as the Lord of the Sabbath is the only begotten Son, St. Eusebius of Caesarea. It was indeed the only begotten Logos of God, which is found in the bosom of the, of the one who, by condescension, became visible to men. Thus it is that the glory of Christ was seen by the prophet, not, of course, with his fleshly eyes, but with his internal eyes, enlightened by the Spirit, according to St. Procopius of Gaza. By the way, these are saints and fathers of the church that are of, often totally ignored or, under, or, or not even known about uh, by many who would pour over uh, and try to understand the scriptural passages. So you're getting not only uh, these great insights of St. John Chrysostom and others, but you're, you're reading church fathers and writers that are often totally ignored and give us uh, greater insight into some of these more obscure things in the Old Testament. So clearly seeing here in the, in the vision of the prophet Isaiah is so important uh, in, in the Old Testament with regard to Christology, that this is indeed the logo. St. Cyril of Jerusalem explains it thus. The prophet Isaiah had seen this throne before the incarnate presence of the Lord. No one has ever seen the Father, for he who appeared to the prophet then was the Son. All right, so again, this basic principle pointing us to the Son in, in the vision of prophet Isaiah. The thrice holy hymn that we hear in this vision, 
The holy, holy, holy denotes the Trinity, whereas the Lord of Sabbath, of Sabbath, indicates the one nature. For the Lord of Sabbath, of host, is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. By the way, this is a very important point, encountering the various Monophysite Christologies uh, and, and errors. Uh, they tend to think of the thrice, thrice holy hymn, the Trisagion, as referring uh, to the Lord alone. And they distort this hymn to serve their own uh, Christology, which is very revealing. And uh, uh, so here, this is the Holy Trinity. The one nature is referred to by the Lord of Sabbath. And this is the one nature for the Lord of Sabbath is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All three, of course, are the Lord of the Sabbath. Thus, the thrice holy hymn refers to the Holy Trinity and the glory which filled the house, even though the Father is referred to it as the glory of Christ, it is common to the entire Holy Trinity. Of course, the glory is common to the three persons. It's not just for one person. It is, however, he who appears as God on the high throne is the Son. All right, so he who appeared to, to the prophet on the throne is the Son. And this is what, uh, what Isaiah saw. None, nothing less than the Son himself on the throne, and he, as he will come and appear. He who appears to the gods of the Old Testament is the Son of Logos, according to Eusebius of Caesarea. For he alone among the Holy Trinity will become incarnate and become visible to men. He is the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father and possesses his own majesty, is made visible and apprehensible to men. So just doubling, tripling, and quadrupling down, the fathers are very, very clear. But not only the fathers, the liturgical life and the hymnography of the church. Finally, in this section, the vision of the prophet Isaiah, finally the church, as she chants in the Katabasias of the feast of the presentation of Christ in the temple, or the Ipapandis in Greek, likewise holds that he who is sitting on the throne is the Son and Logos who became incarnate. When Isaiah, this is from the feast, the hymnography, when Isaiah beheld God symbolically on an exalted throne attended by angels of glory, he cried, O wretched man that I am, I have seen beforehand the incarnate God, the Lord of peace and unwaning light. So clearly identifying the vision of Isaiah here with the... Lord of glory, who will then take on flesh. So let's go on to the one of the most interesting and important, I would say, sections of tonight's talk, if not the whole of this section on the manifestations in the old of the fleshless logos, and that is the ancient of days. Very interesting. We could talk a lot more than we're going to tonight, and I encourage you to go look at the iconography. Uh, and listen to the hymnography. Very interesting tonight. We'll hear some things that we've never heard, never may maybe paid attention to in the various feasts from the hymnography of the church about the ancient of days. And there's actually some uh, patristic differentiation here, which is of interest. In the awesome vision of the prophet Daniel, he who appears as the ancient of days is God, just as he who is coming on the clouds of heaven, as the Son of Man, is also God, to whom it was given dominion, honor, eternal authority, and everlasting kingdom. So this ancient of days is God. And so, just like the one who is coming on the clouds of heaven, the Son of Man, is also God. So they're connecting those two very clearly. Um Let's bring up. Let's bring up. Hopefully, for our uh, the benefit of everybody, because we're assuming everybody's going to very familiar with Daniel seven nine to twenty eight. Let me put that on the screen, and we'll come back, uh, and um, and we'll continue on. So Daniel nine uh, What did I say? One second. Should have had this all ready to go. Uh, 7, 9 to 28. All right. And let's read it together. 
and that'll help us, I think, orient as opposed to just assuming everybody's very familiar with uh, with the text. Let's put it on the screen and, and share it. All right, so hopefully that'll come up on the screen. Let me put it. That's very small. Let me get out of here. Hmm. Nope. There we go. And we'll bring this up. All right. So I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Daniel 7, 9 to 28. The Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the, fi the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. He is... The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which were the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they, ha they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season in time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, one like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days. So we have, very interesting, we'll talk about this in a second. So we have one like the Son of Man coming to another like uh, coming to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him, given him dominion and glory and kingdom, and all people and nations and language should, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which should not, shall not be destroyed. So this is very interesting. That the one like the Son of Man comes to the one of the like the Ancient of Days. And there was given to him, to the Son of Man, what? Dominion, glory, and kingdom, and all the people should serve him. His dominion was everlasting. Who could that be? Well, it's obviously Christ. It's obviously the Logos. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me came near unto them and stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of things. These great beasts, which are four and four kings, which should arise out of the earth. This is the famous vision, which we've all, we've all talked about in the book of Revelation. So that's the pertinent section that we want to talk about tonight. We're not going to go into the other section. But that the line 13 we'll discuss in a moment. And, of course, 9, where the two instances of the Ancient of Days is mentioned. And there's been a lot of discussion among um, Orthodox theologians throughout the uh, the ages uh, and in our day, just how who is this Ancient of Days and how he should be depicted. And then it also go, rolls into this question of how should the the Father, if the Father can be depicted. All right, so let's keep going in our in our uh, uh, presentation of the book. And then we'll run into this question of who is this? Is this the is this the logos or is it the Father? For the Holy Fathers who interpreted Scripture, the Son of Man is without question the Son of God, the Theanthropos Jesus. Ziga uh, Zigavino, sorry, uh, and I'm not familiar really with every source in this book, and I'm not familiar with this particular source. I need to be though. Who is that? He says, who is that who as the Son of Man received the authority and irrevocable upon all? The irrevocable authority he received, which is applicable to all. It was no man but the God-man Christ. In the form of the Son of Man, the prophet sees the incarnation of the only begotten Son, calling him who is to be born of Maria, the Son of Man. All right, so we the reference to the man clearly here is the God-man Jesus Christ. And the prophet sees the incarnation. This is a vision of the incarnation. So the come flesh, right? The one who became the God-man, who became flesh. That's who is the Son of Man that's referred to in the scripture we just read. There are, however, different views as to who is the Ancient of Days. So we have the Son of Man. Everybody agrees that's the incarnation that's he sees the incarnation what about the son of, what about the ancient of days who's this some of the holy fathers expressed a view that the ancient of days is the father 
Stan Cyril of Alexander writes, Daniel saw the father as if in an advanced age, crowned with white hair and exceedingly white clothing like as snow. That's St. Cyril of Alexandria, one of the greatest church fathers in the history of the church. And others wrote, it is said that the Ancient of Days is the father, Didymus of Alexandria, again from the School of Alexandria. And the Ancient of Days is none other than the Lord of all, the Father of Christ, according to St. Hippolytus of Rome. So pretty important early church fathers see the Ancient of Days as the father. But is that what the church has accepted and embraced and shows forth? And is it the consensus of the church fathers? If indeed the Ancient of Days was identified with the Father, then this appearance of the Father with the form of a man would constitute the great, the only exception to the 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 Theophanies of the Old Testament, in which the fleshless Son and Logos appeared either in the form which he would have after his incarnation or with his incarnation, or in a variety of ways that he appeared. He had a variety of ways of appearing. Likewise, there has never been there has never been at any other time the simultaneous appearance of the Father and the Son. This may be what St. John Chrysostom had in mind when he wrote about the prophet Daniel. He was the first and last to see the Father and Son at the same time as if they were before him. All right, so this would be an extreme, the only exception in all of the 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 theophanies that you would have the Father first, and then you would have the Father and Son appearing together. It does not exist anywhere else. So is it the church, is it the consensus of the fathers? We do not encounter the appearance of the Father in human form anywhere else in Scripture, but the Father did not become man. Daniel saw the likeness of a man. As if the Son of Man had come to the Ancient of Days. No one has seen the nature of God, but only the type and the image of that which would happen in the future for the Son and Logos of God was to become man. Right? So no one has seen the nature. Daniel sees the likeness of a man as if the Son of Man had come to the Ancient of Days. So we see the likeness of a man who never seen the nature and we've seen the type and the image of what's going to come. For the Son and Logos of God was to become man, truly to become man, in order to unite with our nature and become visible on the earth. All those who saw, they worshipped or they venerated the type and the image of the future. So what we've seen here is the type and the image of the future. Of what, what future? Of Christ. We're seeing the type and the image of Christ in both the one and the other. The numerable patristic and hymnographic testimonies exclude the possibility of the appearance of God the Father as the Ancient of Days. So even though we have some church fathers who say it was the Father, the innumerable patristic, the consensus of the fathers, and the hymnographic testimonies exclude this as being the correct under understanding. We have apparently two parallel appearances of the Son. Two parallel appearances of the one Son. Why? Well, it becomes apparent. Such that with the Ancient of Days it understood the divine nature, the beginningless and the eternal. And with the Son of Man, his incarnation is presented, the human nature of the Son. So you see, essentially, the incarnation. This is an image of the incarnation, both, not just the Son of Man, but also the Ancient of Days is pointing toward the divine humanity is pointing to the divine nature and the human nature. Quoting now the Saint Athanasius the Great, his humanity is denoted by the Son of Man. All right, that's the one. That's hard, that's easy to understand. With quote, the ancient of days, the blessed Daniel teaches the eternal. For that is how some interpreters understood it and wrote instead of ancient of days, ancient in days. That's by Theodore the Theodoretos of, of Kiro. All right, so he's saying here we've seen Daniel's teaching us in this way, and we're being manifested us through Daniel, the eternal. St. Romanos, the Melodist, also agrees with this view and says characteristically that Christ was recognized by Daniel as the Son of Man 
and Ancient of Days, Ancient and New, One Lord. All right, so we're basically seeing the divine and human natures of the one Theanthropos. Uh, that's how we understand the appearance of the Ancient Days. So Ancient of Days as uh, an image is pointing to the one Lord, Jesus Christ. And the images that you've seen here that we've gone through in the previous slides, those are all images in different icons in northern Greece and Mount Athos of the Ancient of Days. On, but has a, has a slightly different appearance, doesn't he? He's, he's at white hair like we read about. He has white beard, white hair. And he has a slightly different presentation with this triangle pointing us to the Ancient of Days. It says right here, Sus Christos, Jesus Christ, O Palion y Meron, the Ancient of Days, and with white hair. This goes back five, six, seven hundred years. I forget exactly. This is from Castoria, where I used to live, in one of the beautiful ancient churches there. All right, so that's what's being depicted as revealed to Isaiah in the ancient, in the, in the vision. And it's the divine side of the divine humanity is being depicted. I mean, it, the, the depiction here is of, is of the Theanthropos, of course. But in the vision, he's seeing these, and they're representing the type. And this is what they're venerating, the type of what will come, the incarnation. The innumerable patristic iconographies. Oh, no, we're already past that, sorry. Scriptures, we've read this. Scriptures, Scripture, should say, is interpreted by Scripture. One of the basic keys, right? When you want to understand Scripture, the first thing you do is to look at other portions of Scripture and, and put them in context. And that's what the fathers do. The fathers are masters at, of the Scriptures. They know in and out the Holy Scriptures. And so they can interpret one passage in light of all the others and of the experience of the church. Scripture is interpreted by Scripture. That the Son of the, is the Ancient of Days is also apparent from the identity of his form with that of the Son of Man in Revelation. All right, so let's go to Revelation, they're saying. Let's see what Revelation is to say. The end and the beginning, it's all one. Revelation is understood so often by looking at the typologies and the uh, theophanies in the Old Testament, refiguring and pointing to, uh, as you've seen every Tuesday night with our lectures series, we're looking at the uh, book of Revelation, and so often we're making references to the fathers, to the uh, prophets in the Old Testament. So this, the, that the Son is the Ancient of Days is also apparent from the identity of his form with that of the Son of Man in Revelation. And we read in Revelation 1.14, his head and his hairs were like wool, white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. This is exactly what we saw in Isaiah, right? So the book of Revelation, St. John, the Lord is telling us that what, they, what Isaiah saw is the same that John has seen, and that is the Theanthropos, the God-man. He is God with the same form then and now. In Revelation, he is called the Son of Man. However, he has the form and the characteristics of the Ancient of Days in order to show that the Ancient of Days is the Son. All right, so this is conclusive. Although we have St. Cyril and we have others, this is conclusive that we're talking about the Son. This is not the Father. In any case, if these testimonies, which we which uh, we see in the ancient of days of uh, God the Father, are set aside, so we saw those church fathers, a few of them. We, if we just put them aside for a minute, what we will see is that the overwhelming majority of the holy fathers identify the ancient of days with the Son. And of course, as I just said, the Book of Revelation points us to the truth of things here. In one of the works of the Church Fathers, in particular St. Athanasius the Great, we read, the Ancient of Days became a child. So here again, St. Athanasius the Great, kind of strange that St. Cyril of Alexandria, who was following not long after St. Athanasius the Great, had a different understanding, but nonetheless, 
the Ancient of Days became a child. St. Maximus the Confessor says, identifies the Ancient of Days with the Son. And he says, God appeared as an old man to Daniel, Ancient of Days, having white hair on his head, according to which he was named the Ancient of Days, but also as a young man, as one younger than the white-haired elder Abraham, when he appeared to him as a man together with the angels, indeed, as a young man. In both of these the theophanies, it is apparent that it is the same God, the Son. Quote, it is said about the Savior, that which was written by Daniel. They saw, and behold, thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days sat thereupon, St. Gregory of Nyssa. Likewise, St. Cyril of Jerusalem writes, Let the entire earth worship, let every tongue chant, let, let them glorify God as a babe of 40 days and pre-eternal, a babe small and also ancient of days, a babe which is breastfed and also the creator of the ages. All right, clearly St. Cyril, seeing the ancient of days as the so the to be to be in the future incarnate logos, as Saint Methodius of Olympus identifies uh, the Ancient of Days with the Son. He says the righteous Simeon received in his old embrace the Ancient of Days as an infant. So we are not depicting the Father in the Ancient of Days, and therefore this is not a support for the idea that we should have icons of the Father. We cannot point to the Ancient of Days and say, here is an image of the Father. Clearly, from the Fathers and from the hymnography. But let's look at some more hymnography before we open it up to questions. In addition to the patristic testimonies, the entire hymnography of the Church leaves no room to doubt that the Ancient of Days is the Logos which became man. How many of us run to the hymnography of the church? Or how many of us run to the iconography of the church to learn the faith? We should have a we should do a poll tonight. Where's where's our friend Caesar? Everybody wants likes polls. Let's do a poll. How many of us, and I I, I will be uh, confess that I am not outside of this uh, this question, and I need also to become much more of a student like St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco was of the hymnography. I'm so happy that this. The fathers and the authors of this book are pointing us to these hymn, hymns that often go overlooked, right? We just we we're not paying attention. We're not in church at, during the matin service. We're not paying attention closely because maybe it's in a foreign language, or we're just not paying attention. And so uh, here is so much of our theology, right? And so much of what kept the church going through the many many dark days of persecution. The Turkish period is still going on in Asia Minor to this day. We have the Turks. Uh, uh, you know, over whatever has been left of Romeo Sini in uh, in Asia Minor, and so we have we have had dark days where you know pouring over the patristic text was impossible or very hard. They just didn't exist in many places, and they didn't have access to them. So what did they do? The divine services, the matins, the orthros, the, the hymnography, which had come down to them from the eighth, ninth, tenth centuries, especially from the seventh to the tenth centuries. And and all the way all the way through um, until the fall of Constantinople, you had and to this day you have hymnographers writing and 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 enriching the church's uh, understanding of 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 the Lord and the economy of salvation. How many of us take refuge and read and pay attention and prepare ourselves and look at the divine services, especially at least for the major feasts? All right, start there. Let's all start there. Let's all first me and then all of you. Let's make a commitment that at the next big feast coming up, which would be, well, there are many feasts, but let's, let's say Pascha at least, that we're not going to just go to church, but we're going to get a, get the text ahead of time and study it and learn the mind of Christ through divine hymnography. And then also pour over uh, the, hymn, the, uh, the uh, iconography, which teaches us so much about the, the person of Christ. So in addition to the patristic testimonies, we have the hymnography. And the entire hymnography of the church leaves no room to doubt that the Ancient of Days is the Logos which became man. 
The Ancient of Days becomes an infant for me, it says in the Kathisma of Matins, Presentation of the Lord in the Temple. We just had that feast about a month and a half ago. The Ancient of Days, who of old gave the law to Moses on Sinai, today is seen as a babe, the Stichira of the Liti, for the feast, again, of the uh, Presentation of the Lord in the Temple. The Ancient of Days descended into the sanctified womb, like rain upon a fleece, all pure lady, and he, the friend of man, appeared as the new Adam. This is the Theotokion for the Feast of St. Polycarp just a couple weeks ago, February 23rd. The Ancient of Days descended into the sanctified womb. Who's that? That's the Logos. That's the Log Logos of Sarks again, right? Like rain upon a fleece, all pure lady. And again, for the Feast of St. Athanasius of Athos on July 5th, we read... Thou ineffably gave us birth to the ancient of days as a newborn child, showing us new paths of virtue upon the earth. So very clear here that there is no father depicted, no father appearing. This is the ancient of days, the divine and human and uh, human natures being shown forth, and the foreshadowing of the this is this is who had the inheritance and can still run back if they want to their prophets. How do they not see he's everywhere? The logo sarks again, though. He's everywhere, and he's pointed, and the incarnation is pointed to, and the person of Christ is pointed to throughout the Old Testament. And this is why we're sitting here right now, pouring over this. And all of this should become, for you, a great, great support in your faith. It should become, for you, a great deal of uh, spiritual ammunition to show and teach others around you uh, at least point to the truths of the faith to others around you, to the doubters, to the scoffers, if they want to hear, or to your friends and family who are in darkness or don't care, uh, or ignorant or in heterodoxy. Uh, this is all, all of this. If you stick with us for the next year, if we all sit together at the feet of the fathers and the Athenite fathers who put this book together, you will have... A, it, it's going to be unbelievable in a year and a half when we finally finish this book, the vision of Christ is going to be so full, so dynamic, so deep. We're going to see him everywhere. And when, when we go to certain divine services after hearing all this, when we hear the prophecies, when we hear the Old Testament read, oh, there it is. That's Christ. That's the Logos. That's what's referred to. You're going to have a different mind when you go and, and read the scriptures and read the fathers and read the hymnography, it's going to be an amazing journey. So stick with us. This is the end of lecture six of many lectures to come. And we just looked at the vision of the prophet Isaiah. We looked at the ancient of days. We looked at the lawgiver. Uh, we looked at the God seer seeking the face of Christ in Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, all of these, of course, pointing to Christ, witnessing Christ showing forth Christ. So thanks be to God uh, for that. And uh, we'll open up to questions. We've got a few minutes left, about 15, 20 minutes at least uh, for, for questions. The poll is, do I, somebody, Justin's asking me the poll. What's the poll? The poll is, do I examine and study the hymnography of the church on the major feast days? Do I consult them? Do I look at them to try to understand the feast before I go to the divine services? Something like that. Do I read the hymnography? Do I look to the hymnography for teaching and for understanding the feast? Is it a part of my catechetical structure? Have I, have I, have I had the opportunity? Was I taught by my teachers to look at the hymnography? We, tonight we just said, sat down and looked briefly at just three or four divine services and saw that th there's no doubt as to the consensus in the mind of the church and, the, and Christ, as to the person who is the Ancient of Days, it's the Son. It's not the Father. And that's not a minor thing, because there's been controversies that have sp split Orthodox Christians over this question of depicting the Father, which is connected to, to a certain degree to this question of Ancient of Days. There's been controversies uh, in, the old, in the ancient church with who is this God of the Old Testament. And so... What we want to know. We want to know what do the church fathers, what's the consensus, what are the what's the hymnography? And so we can be in the truth, but also help others because these things inevitably come up. 
and uh, and really do plague the church when we're ignorant of our own tradition. Let's go to the first question. We're gonna, if we have anything over at Crowdcast, we do not. Look forward to your questions at Crowdcast, and let's go to this first question here. Father, I'm confused about how to do the Great Lent fast. All right. About eating and drinking rules, there are people who still eat, but uh, who still eat but little. There are people who don't eat or drink. How should we do fasting? Well, first of all, this is something you would go to your spiritual father about, or your priest, or you would consult the church fathers. But I'm happy to try to answer it for you. But I hope that you also have that person in your life who can guide you. Secondly. Uh, there are basic uh, guidelines and rules for fasting. First and foremost, we have to say that it's not if we, it's not if we fast. That is not a question. We fast. All Orthodox Christians fast. You cannot be an Orthodox Christian without fasting. Let's just make that very clear to all of our uh, inquirers, all of our uh, catechumens, all of those who don't know or maybe you grew up in the faith, but you're clueless uh, and you're coming to the faith now and wanting to go deeper. It is not possible to be an Orthodox Christian without fasting. The Lord did not say if, but when you fast, it was assumed you would fast. All right. Secondly, the saints have said, as I've said many times here, that you cannot be a Christian without fasting. Why? Because we lost paradise because we broke the fast. There was a command, do not eat. We ate, Adam and Eve ate. And so to go enter into paradise again, we have to fast. And that's not just a question of ascetic struggle. It's first and foremost a question of obedience. You To be in paradise, to be in communion, you have to be obedient. You have to keep his commandments. His commandments are life. They're not for his benefit, for ours. They're the medicine of the soul. If we don't fast, we don't have any hope of overcoming and subduing, through the grace of God, of course, the passions. So it is a great, great tragedy that millions upon millions upon millions of people who call themselves Christians, mostly, thank God, outside of the Orthodox Church, although there are plenty of Orthodox Christians who probably do not fast very strictly or at all, but they know the teachings of the church and they're not listening. Whereas outside among the heterodox, many, especially reformed Protestants, do not really have much of a fast to speak of if it's very, very limited. So fasting is essential. It's only through prayer and fasting that, that the demons, the passions, and the, the demons are behind the passions will depart from us. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, the church laid down on the basis of coming out of the monastic centers and the ascetic struggles. That's why people who talk about, well, there's, you know, the, the monasteries, monastic life has nothing to do with us. Uh, uh, no, uh, the whole life of the church for at least over a thousand years, if not a thousand, 300 years, is, is guided by the monastic typicon. Much of what we do in the parishes, including the typicon for fasting, but the divine services, has been determined in the monasteries. There is no dichotomy there. So the monasteries guide us on how to live the liturgical life and how to live the fast life. Now, degrees are going to be greatly different across the spectrum. There's going to be degrees of intensity and, and, and participation. We understand that depending on our weaknesses and our sicknesses and our conditions in life and all the rest. But this is the norm, the, the, the standard, so to speak, not the norm, the standard, what we're called to the criteria is coming out of the monasteries. So the monasteries laid it down. You can go to a book like, for instance, the Lenten Triodion, and there's a whole introduction by Bishop Callisto Square where he talks about the rule of fasting. Now, he also adds his own commentary in there, which may or may not be all applicable or, or, or the best to listen to. I don't remember. It's been years since I read it. But, you know, his own commentary is his commentary. The Typicon is what we should be uh, listening to. And then how we apply it in our life, that's going to depend uh, on a, a number of factors. Are we brand new to the faith? Are we just getting started? Are we 
Are we in a, in an environment that's very uh, problematic for whatever reason? We're going to work with our spiritual father to apply it to the maximum possible that we can do. Uh, or uh, am I, a, is somebody's a pregnant, you know, pregnant white woman, obviously it's not going to fast anywhere like an ascetic in the desert. Okay. So she's going to eat for the sake of her baby uh, and, and things like this. There are plenty of these kind of exceptions, so to speak, which are justified and right. Now, what happens is many of us uh, will not, um, will grow accustomed to uh, a, a fast, which is, I think this is the most common error. According to kind, it is it is true. It is right. And we keep that. Maybe not. Maybe there's a lot of people don't. But in my experience, that a lot of people try to keep that. In other words, what we eat. So the dietary change happens for a lot of people. But is that is that the fast? Is that the, is that all we need to do? Not by a long shot. The fast is not just changing what we eat. So we no longer eat dairy. We no longer eat meat for 40 days. We don't eat. We don't eat we drink drink wine or oil for 40 days, except on the sun, Saturday and Sunday, right during the during the week, Monday to Friday. No meat. No dairy. No wine and oil. No uh, none of that. We're eating basic boiled food or uh, uh, or raw food or fruits and vegetables or whatever, right? Boiled food. So it's a real simple and meant to be a simple diet. Now, you can eat very healthy today, especially in the Western world. There's tons of food. So you, there's no reason people say, oh, I, I can't get my protein. I can't. No, you can get everything today. There's so much available. There's no need for us to break the fast to get what we need. I don't think so. Uh, you, have, you, you might have to spend some money, but you can get the proteins and things you need and stay within that 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 basic uh, those basic boundaries. And why is it so important that we stay in the boundaries? Because at least on that level, we're being obedient. It's all about first and foremost denying our will and being obedient. That's that's what we that's what is so basic to all the Christian life. And so clear in the lives of the saints that that's the key to advancing in prayer, advancing in all the rest is when we're humble and obedient to God. And so on the very basic level of at least keeping the kind of food we eat, we try and struggle to be obedient and we deny ourselves. We don't eat outside those boundaries. It's You might think, well, that's very legalistic. No, it's a struggle of love for Christ. And if, if it's not in that context, then yeah, it won't be very profitable. If you're doing it, for anything but Christ and in and, and for Christ, yeah, the profit's going to be more limited. Absolutely. No question about it. It's just like anything. You have a relationship with somebody. Well, I didn't fornicate. Therefore, I'm a good husband. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> That's a minimum, right? You kept the boundaries. But why? Because you love your wife. You, you live for your wife and your children. It's very different. So you could have externally the same fulfillment between a husband who's, you know, a total loser. <laughs> Externally, though, he keeps the boundaries, right? He doesn't go outside those boundaries. Uh, but he's not doing it for Christ or his wife. Uh, and you get somebody who's, who's, you know, doesn't really appear that much different in terms of the external boundaries. But in his heart, he's loving and doing it for his wife. Like he's, his whole heart is into it. All right. So that's something that's between you and, and each one of us and God. But that's so essential if we're going to have spiritual profit out of the 40 days but at least the 40 at least the boundaries need to be kept and that's a part of the question of obedience secondly there is this error that most of us commit and i and i'll say that i i committed as well and that is that yes i keep that yes i you know i struggle to not fall out of the boundaries but the quantity of food we've grown so used to and so much food available and so easily accessible that a lot of times we do not do well in cutting back the quantity. Now, in the Patrist in the monastic Tipicon, a true fast, as we've said elsewhere in, in our live streams, is uh, according to Akrivi, according to Exactitude, it, it is to eat one meal a day after the ninth hour, which would be 3 p.m. And that would be a fasting meal. On fast days, in the more struggling monasteries, they don't eat anything on Wednesday and Friday. They might drink something or, or or take some tea or something, but they don't. So that's the that's the ideal or whatever you want to call it. That's the struggle that many people uh, in you know the more ascetic of us are going to try to uh, achieve. 
is that what most people are doing? No. The reality is that most people are not keeping a strict total fast until 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And there's a variety of reasons why that, and each one has to, you know, examine why and how and and go to the spiritual father and, and work it out. And that's why we should not look to the left or the right during the fast. Let everyone do what their conscience is telling them according to the spiritual father's direction. Uh, and so that's why I can't tell you exactly what kind of fast you should be doing. I can tell you the basics, the minimum. I can t t try to point you to the meaning and the, uh, you know, the spiritual uh, goals here that we have. But your particular fast, the degree that what you're going to do it, how much you're going to eat, and and then, you know, uh, if you're able, whatever for whatever reason, to keep the the fast as it's been laid down by the father, which as we said, no meat, no oil, no no dairy from Monday to Friday, and then only uh, oil and wine on the weekends. Uh, so that's the basic, right? But the fast is not meant to be a dietary change. It's not meant to be, a, you know, a periodic, uh, what do they call it? Uh, um, you know, fasting uh, according, you know, 18 hours a day and then eat six hours and this, this whole thing. You could do that. You could be... <laughs> You could be outside the church and have anything to do with Christianity, and you could do something like what we do in the Orthodox Church. You know, you could eat like you know once a day between three and six in the afternoon. You, you know, trying to lose weight or something. That's obviously not what's what's really the goal here. What's the goal? The goal is to through the fast to draw close to Christ in prayer. So the fast serves our prayer. It makes us more prone to prayer gives us more time for prayer it takes us away from the uh the subjugation of the belly and the thinking it, it helps us to focus we're not distracted by the belly there are many many good things from fasting for the sake of prayer and then also for the sake of our neighbor right so instead of being consumed by what i'll eat and what i'll drink and how quickly i can you know indulge myself on that level i'm concerned about my neighbor i spend more time in prayer and also uh you know, philanthropy for my neighbor is to free us to be virtuous. Basically it's to focus us on the path of virtue. So it's going to lead us to a deeper spiritual life, a deeper love of Christ and our neighbor. That's what the ultimate goal of fasting should be, right? To free us, to bring us back into paradise and communion with God and, to, and, and, and bring us further down on the path from the image to the likeness to become like God, like Christ. That's the goal, and that's, that's what salvation looks like. So fast is cornerstone, basis. Can't, ha can't be an Orthodox Christian without it. Can't make progress spiritually without it. It's not just about dietary change. It's not just a quantity decrease or whatever. It's really all about, and, each, and, and there's going to be, a, you know, each one's going to, in that, within that boundary, each one's going to do a bit different for their conditions and their, and their, and their lifestyle. But, should we, if we're if we're making if we're struggling or making progress, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a challenge, and it should be. We should get out of our comfort zone. We should we should have times and moments that when our belly is aching because we haven't eaten anything for a long time. We should have times when we really want to eat something and we don't. Right? I mean, it'd be great if we never want to eat any of that. We made a lot of progress, but but for a lot of us, it'll be a, it'll we'll have struggles like oh, I really wish I could eat X, but I'm not going to. And we learn to deny that will, and we learn to deny those impulses and that and that demand of the of the flesh, and we become free through this whole struggle. And then we prepare ourselves throughout the whole forty days for the great feast of Pascha. And so, when you arrive at Pascha, we're ready to go. Spiritually, we're focused. Spiritually, we're we're trimmed down. Spiritually, we're freer. Spiritually, we're uh, ready to totally embrace. Uh, the Holy Week, the feast, the fa the, fa the uh, services, and all the rest. Okay, I don't know. Hopefully that helps. Hopefully that helps you focus on what you need to do. Father, thank you. My question is about death. Are we reunited in paradise with our loved ones? It's a great question. A lot of people ask that question. So, paradise begins here. We enter into paradise here. He brought us paradise here. Right, paradise meaning I don't mean literally the paradise, but the spiritual reality of paradise, like with the foretaste, the the antechamber. Right, it all starts here. We enter now. 
So if we enter now, and we're in communion with Christ now, and we're one in Christ now, we're going to be one in Christ then. Salvation begins here. The kingdom of God begins here. And then death becomes a doorway, a passageway, not a dead end, not something fearful, not something dark. It's a door that opens into light. So the answer to your question is, are you and your loved ones one in Christ? Are they struggling to be in Christ? Will they be in, then we're all going to be together. Not just your loved ones, everyone. It's not, if we are truly members of Christ, we're going to feel everybody in the church to be our, our relatives. To be our, you know, love them as we love Christ and seek to be loved by Christ. We're going to love them. We're going to be one with them in Christ. Uh, so if that if that's happening now in this world, then it'll it'll be just a, a continuation. Um, I don't know, you know, where will you be? I be your loved ones be in terms of their con spiritual condition. Only God knows that. I, ca I can't answer that. But whether we will be together in Christ will be reflected and uh, apparent already in this world. Father, in 1667, Church of Russia banned depictions of God the Father on icons. Does that mean they interpreted the ancient days to be the Father? I don't know. I'm not familiar with this. Uh, I'm not familiar with the particular particulars of the Russian debate. Uh, I was some a little familiar with what happened in Greece in the 1980s, and, and there was a big schism between some old calendarists uh, over this question, but not even that familiar with that, to tell you the truth. So I don't know what what was at, at stake. Uh, possibly, uh, I think it, I think it, I think there was this idea. Uh, there is this idea, rather. I don't know what was going on in Russia, so I can't answer you. But there is this idea that we must not have depictions of the ancients of ancient of days uh, because it's been depicting the father. Um, now the question is: you had you see icons even to this day in in a lot of parishes, in mostly Russian parishes, in my experience, but also other parishes that has um, Christ on the right or on the right looking at us or on our left and then what looks like it could be the god the father it looks like they're saying god the father and some icons and or it could be interpreted as the ancient of days which would be the vision of isaiah that we just talked about tonight right so or uh sorry daniel and so um you know if an icon is showing us the ancient of days and says the ancient of days and then it has Christ, and like in the second coming, Son of Man, then that's true to Scripture. But if it says God the Father, and it has, you know, peculiar things about that are trying to show us that this is God the Father, then, then we're, not, we're not following what we just presented, right? The, the patristic consensus. So was that at stake in, in, in 1667? I don't know. Bet you can find out, though, and I bet there's plenty of literature on it, but I don't know. Are the prayers of the OCA prayer book hymns? Are the prayers of the OCA prayer book hymns? Prayers usually are just prayers. I mean, they're not hymns. I'm not sure. I don't really understand the question. So prayers are prayers. Hymns are hymns. Do they have hymns in the prayer book? Yeah, probably. A lot of prayer books do. Have excerpts and traparia and things like that. Does this channel agree with Bishop Mar Mar Emmanuel and Christ the Good Shepherd Church? Uh, if that bishop is the Nestorian bishop that is very well known, no, absolutely not. He's an Nestorian. He's not a part of the Orthodox Church. He doesn't teach the Orthodox faith. And he's been shown by Orthodox friends of ours online to have to teach uh, Nestorian ecclesiology or Nestorian uh, Christology. So if that's who you're talking about, I, I'm assuming that is who you're talking about. Unless there's somebody out there, I don't know. But he's very well known. And he's very outspoken about a lot of social and political issues and things. And he says a lot of things that are true. But unfortunately, um, I, I don't know much about him. I've heard different things. Some I've heard somebody say he's actually not even in the historian church. Others say he is an historian. Others say, I don't know. Uh, but from what I've seen, he does teach things that are not in um, agreement with the Orthodox faith. And we're not in communion with him. That's for sure. He's not in the Orthodox Church. 
All right, so next question. Father Bless, do you think God works miracles through icons depicting God the Father if they are considered theologically incorrect by the majority of the church fathers? I don't know. God can do whatever he wants. I, I, I don't have any experience of that, though, so I can't speak to it. I found a copy of the rudder, the medallion. Is that a text that may be redone or released by Uncle Mountain? Well, uh, some of our, our closest co-workers are working on producing a new version. It's 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 been kind of stalled for about six months. Uh, it's got it's getting very close to being ready, and it will be published. And I'm pretty sure uh, that the publisher will be St. Anthony's Monastery, but I don't know for sure if that's finally what will happen. But that's my understanding that that's that's who's uh, who's pushing that uh, project. And uh, so we can hopefully, I, I really would love to see that out as soon as possible. You, you, for those who don't know, uh, the pedalion, the, the rudder of St. Nicodemus, which was approved. Uh, and blessed by the ecumenical patriarchate at the end of the uh, <clears throat> end of the 18th century, circulated and 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 translated into many languages and used by Orthodox churches for the last 200 years, and uh, um, the uh, the English translation was done 60 years ago or something, uh, but very poor, very problematic, lots of errors, and so there's been an effort to to bring that back uh, into English in a proper way. And it's a collection of all the canons of all the councils that, that are recognized by the church. And of course, many people say, you don't, you should not read the Padalian, don't read the Padalian, you're a layman, only priest should read the Padalian. And we hear this kind of thing. Uh, the, the, the canons are only for those who apply the canons and all the rest. But that's not what St. Nicodemus taught. It's not what the fathers taught. They didn't say off limits. Uh, the application, obviously, is done by the priest. Uh, but we can learn a tremendous amount from the canons. It's, it's, it's a collection of the great wisdom and discernment of the church fathers in council on so many, many, many important issues. Um, should we go, therefore, after we read a canon and start to apply it? No. Just like you shouldn't start applying much of anything spiritually on yourself without a blessing of your spiritual father. This is not a, this is not a controversy. This is not a mystery. This is not a problem. Like, read a lot, but always go and check with your spiritual father before you start applying, sharing, promoting, and all the rest, right? So um, that's just real basic. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't read the book. And we have the Ex Mulligatarian that we published, uh, and that's by St. Nicodemus, and it has canons in it by St. John the Faster, and it's filled with amazing wisdom for all of us and brings us to compunction and contrition, and that's why it's been translated by Father George Dokus, which who, who we are eternally grateful to for his struggle and his work in bringing that into the English language. And we're grateful to God that we were able to publish it. And so absolutely we should pour over these texts and uh, and um, and these canons, and they will be greatly beneficial. But, of course, with discernment and humility and with the blessing of our spiritual father. So God willing, that will be available to you and many others in the near future. I can't tell you the date. I don't think anybody knows the date, but they're, they're getting closer, closer and closer to getting ready. I'm at a road court parish in New York, and there are no real structure to the catechism. Is this concerning? Yes, of course there is a problem. Like, why wouldn't we have a structured catechism? That's really important for all of us. And it should be, it should be not just an intellectual endeavor, but a whole initiation, a whole process of purification in which we are divested from the ways of our previous life and of the world and of the ideas of the world and the habits of the world and the and the the the, uh, the whole approach of the world to to our life and it's a process of purification and if we don't go through that properly uh, we will not uh, enjoy the great outpouring uh, and experience of the grace of God due to our due to our own limitations right so god will pour out as he always does in every way in his mysteries he's given and gives himself in every mystery including the baptism chrismation communion the first first time we enter the church however how we experience that how we participate in that to what degree we we experience and feel the grace of god that's going to vary depending on uh our struggle and our preparation and so it's extremely important that each one of us who are coming to the church and approaching the mysteries are properly initiated into the mysteries. Uh, so God help you um, to find uh, to find that. I hope that your priest will help you, uh, but it's uh, it's really important. And uh, 
you need to go find it. Uh, you need to find a way to be, make sure you're, you're properly initiated. Uh, you might have to do a lot on your own. You might have to go uh, and supplement it. I don't know. I don't know the practical solution for you. I'm not suggesting you leave your pairs. I'm just saying you need it. That's that's very clear. Fasting with the church, praying with the church, uh, in every way, living the life of the church before baptism, life confession before baptism. Um, you know, if you didn't, you know, things that you took for granted in the world no longer apply. A lot of times in the church, we change our whole way of life. That's a process. It takes a couple of years, uh, if not much longer. And so really important. Cannot stress it enough. Father Bless, as the church is considered perfect, but is a divine human institution, how do we separate the human imperfections and errors from the perfection of the divine in the church? So the perfection of the church is Christ, of course, and we're united to that in the mysteries. And insofar as we align our life and our thoughts and our words and our deeds to him and his will, we grow and approach closer and closer to the uh, perfection he told us to be. He told us, be perfect. And he didn't say be perfect once. He said, keep on being perfect. That's the scripture. That's the meaning in Greek, Right. Greek does not say once, it says a continual present. Perfection is an ever-growing and ever-present uh, reality. It's not a one-time out. And Obviously, think about it. How, how could it be? How could perfection be? God is, e e is eternal, is infinite. There is no end to his perfection. There is no end to it growing in him. So perfection cannot be a static thing, but it's a dynamic thing that ever grows. So, so we're ever growing in his perfection by conforming our life and our words and our thoughts and our deeds and our impulses and our glances and our decisions and our desires and everything about us to his will and to his uh, likeness. So insofar as we do that, then there is no separation. Insofar as we don't, do, there are grave separations to the point where you might have people in the church on a very superficial level and really not in the church at all spiritually. They could be totally heretics. They could be totally immoral. They could be committing mortal sins and they could still be coming to church. They could be the priest. They could be the bishop. They could be the patriarch. They could be anybody because everybody's free. Everybody's free to do whatever they want, right? You can turn away from Christ and still say you're a Christian. Now the church's discipline is meant to not allow that confusion and that delusion to persist. Well, in our day and age, we have a gross lack of discipline in many places. And so there's a lot of confusion. Uh, and so how do we navigate this? Well, mainly practically, I can just answer you this. Stay focused on the saints. Stay focused on the mon monastic ideal and strugglers. Stay focused, stay focused on those who are uh, par excellence, uh, quintessentially, being and manifesting forth Christ and the church. And then you will grow in discernment and you'll see the differences and you'll be able to discern. And those things which are clearly human and frail and passing, you will see as such and you'll not lose your marbles over them. You'll say, well, there it is. There's the world encroaching and this is a hospital for souls and people are sick. And, uh, but you'll still see Christ and his divine perfection and the divine humanity of the church in spite of it all in the saints, right? So the saints are the uh, true, uh, showing forth true membership in, in the body. And all of us are trying to follow them and imitate them and grow like them in perfection. So I think uh, time, uh, struggle, experience uh, allows you to have the discernment and to understand uh, these, this mystery. How is it possible for there to be divine humanity, for the, it to be the body of Christ and totally Christ, and the church is Christ, and yet at the same time it's all of us who are sinful, slothful, lustful, and yet we're you know in the midst of that we're, we're members of this. How can we be? How can we be members of perfection? How can we be members of Christ? Well, this is a mystery that one experiences and lives and sees, and it's not something you can just unpack. And you can you can you can try to say, oh, this is it. I've got the perfect perfect way to say this. Well. It's not going to be very. Successful. You've got to experience it to understand it. But I think I think I pointed it. I think I pointed to how it might work. Huh? 
Is orthodox ethos humanistic or against it? Well, you haven't watched most of our videos. You're just a total newcomer, if that's even a question, right? Just just go to our or YouTube channel and just go to the playlist, and you'll figure out what we what we teach. Um, I just did a live stream last night on perennialism. Perennialism is the future of ecumenism. It's the new ecumenism. It's the end of the the, the classic ecumenism, and it's going to lead to the Antichrist. So there you go. There's my answer. What do you think? We're totally and utterly opposed to the heresy of ecumenism. Could the entire collection of the books of Apostolos Makrakis be released by Uncle Mountain? No, absolutely not. He was a heretic, and he was condemned as a heretic by the by the Church of Greece. Why would we Why would we want to release his books? Do you know who Apostolos Makrakis is, and why would we want to release his books? No, absolutely not. That's why they're redoing the Pedalion because his disciples were the ones who translated it and made a mess of it. Uh, and uh, you know, I, no, we're not going to collect release anything of his. Jason's World Gifted One Membership. Thank you very much. God bless you. Father, is it true that the Jews are going to accept the Antichrist as their Messiah? Well, some, apparently. He will attract uh, you know, leaders and people who call themselves Jews to him. He will, according to the prophecies, uh, he will try to... Uh, and will succeed in rebuilding the temple and crowning himself in the temple. Uh, and he will uh, be believed to be the Messiah by many. This is what's uh, been prophesied and been told to us by those who have interpreted the scriptures. Um, there will be Jews who will embrace Christ, and there are right now many Jews who are coming to Orthodoxy and glory to God because they have um, Christ and the apostles and the mother of God we're Jews, and uh, it's a tragedy when any of those who are descendants from um, the prophets and uh, the saints and the apostles do not uh, do not follow the Lord. So, uh, as usual, it's both and. There will be Jews who will come increasingly before the end to Christ, and there will be Jews who will embrace and follow the Antichrist. Uh, but that's kind of what will happen to a lot of people. So they're not unlike most of humanity. Elena, Elena Pucci, thank you very much for your donation. It's very kind. All of your donations are well are well used, and we accept them, and we thank God for them. And um, all of it will be going to publishing and conferences and online lectures and all the rest that we do here. Father, what can we do to obtain possible joy? What can you do to obtain possible joy? You have to live the harmo lipi of the church, the joyful sorrow of great Lent. That's how you obtain possible joy. Only if you are crucified with Christ will you rise with Christ. Embrace the cross, and you will have possible joy. Vasilia Ro Romeon. I like that. That's uh, it's good. I don't know if we would spell Romeon with an H, though. But I've never seen it spelled with an H, but I get it. Would it be heresy to reject the doctrine about Mary Magdalene being whore, a whore, since it is, it is an exact historical and was canonized by a pope? Yeah, I don't think that I've ever heard an Orthodox... Christian, I don't know if that's ever been taught by the Orthodox Church, right? Would it be here to reject the doctrine? No. No, it wouldn't be. Wouldn't be heresy to my knowledge. Uh, will God forgive me for fornication is the question. Yes, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. Now, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is to be united again in the same place with Christ. Does he wish every one of us, whatever sin we've committed, is united once again to Christ? Absolutely, that's why he came. He was crucified for us and for our salvation. Were there fornicators in his day that were, re were reunited to Christ? Right there in the scriptures. He, he, he saves one of them from being stoned. And he writes in the, in the dust to the Pharisees who want to stone the sin, their own sins. He says, stoops down and writes in the dust the sins of those Pharisees who are ready to, to throw the first stone. 
And then he tells her who came, go and sin no more. So do you want to be forgiven? Do all of us want to be forgiven? Of course. How? By what process? And what does it look like? That a lot of times is not very well examined. And we think repentance is remorse. We think repentance means feeling bad for something. It's good to feel bad for things that are not good. That's a good thing. That's only the beginning. Repentance is not remorse. Repentance is return. Return means coming back into communion. Return means fulfilling all the presuppositions for communion. Return means confession, a spiritual uh, program, a, a rule or, ca or canon by which we struggle ascetically. We're purified of, the, of the, the, the fruits of our sins, and we were united to Christ through that process of fasting and prayer. That's how we reunite ourselves to Christ, through repentance, which means return, which means conforming ourselves and preparing ourselves to be able to receive the grace of God, uniting ourselves once again to Christ. Repentance means a total reorientation. All right, So get about the business of return. Don't wallow in remorse. Remorse is only the beginning. If you stay there, you'll never be forgiven because you'll never return. Forgiveness in the Greek language means synchorosy. It means to be in the same space, the same place again. You want to be forgiven, you got to be in communion with God. That's when you're forgiven. Right? He forgives you in the one sense of immediately saying, that sin is no longer an obstacle. Come back to me. The Lord says that to all of us if we repent. But the path back is what's really important, right? That's what we should be concerned about. All right, now he said, come back. The door is open, of course. What have I done to go back? You can't force us. It's a process, and it's all about purification. And that purification is the whole ascetic life of the church. So you've got to get about the business of return, of reorientation and return, and communion again, once again, in God. Don't wallow. I've so many people out there wallowing in their remorse. That's a good thing. It needs to then turn into return. Be about the business and the duty and the work of keeping his commandments if you want to be forgiven, if you want to return, if you want to be in communion. Get about the, the, the work of repentance, right? And bring forth the fruits of repentance. Don't listen to the heretical-minded out there who say it's all like a legal contract or a magical thing that Christ does to us. This is a total misunderstanding of what Christ gives because you don't understand human freedom. It's not forgiveness and return is not what Christ does to us only, right? They're only seeing one half of the equation. That's the objective work of salvation that Christ did. He died for us. He rose again. He took our human flesh, our human body to the right hand of God the Father. We are all collectively going to rise on the eighth day. Individually, though, what and how we appropriate and assimilate that great salvation that was given to us, it, it involves our human freedom. And that's where we have to focus and struggle and come back and return and reorient and, and come back into communion with God. I hope that helps. God bless you. Father, just a follow-up question. I am repenting currently. My wife died. We didn't live an orthodox life, although my wife was a good person. Will my repentance and prayers count on her behalf? Thank you. I didn't, didn't I answer this already? I feel like if you asked me this already, and I've already answered you. Is that not right? I'm going to leave this question and tell me, Justin, did I answer this question already? And was it from Todd? I feel like I've already answered it. Oh, we are, I totally forgot about the time. We've got to go over to our, we've got to go over to our other live stream. Time to switch. I totally lost track. <laughs> I like your questions. Good questions tonight. I'm going to tell everybody here, Todd, Medhani, Jason, Raja, Musa, Julie, Pet, uh, Alexander. Um, let me just, let me just, oof, oh my gosh, so many questions here. I love your questions, but we do have our schedule. I think we need to move on to our schedule. Todd, We'll come back to you. If I've not answered your question, we'll come back to that. I want to just thank Anna Prophet. God bless you. Stra Felicias. 
Thanks for joining us here on YouTube. Thank you so much to Pelopida Simfora. Uh, we read in our prayers that we and that and we are prayer delivered from our enemies and to gain victory over them. Is it wrong to pray for your enemies and to ask for victory over them? I ask for your wisdom, Father. But um, you pray for your enemies, for their forgiveness in return. You pray for victory of the Christ, uh, Christ people over the demons and defense of the nation, yes. Uh, but vengeance is God's and praying for victory in return on a personal level, uh, I don't think you'll find that in the lives of the saints. So there's a distinction there. Hopefully you got that. I said it really quick. Look, there are many questions here. Art, Matthias, Christian, Fox Editor, Southeast Soldier, Ken, Chris, uh, Alexander, Julie, uh, I can only say uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions in the in the in the continuation of the of this uh, live stream because what we do right now for all of you who are new, we break and we go to the various platforms where we have uh, the membership platforms, and there we continue for about another hour, hour and a half answering questions. But we also have questions. You can freely ask questions every Tuesday on our live stream after the Revelation course. And when we have special live streams like last night, at the end of our live stream, you can ask questions. You can submit your questions to our Telegram channel. You can send questions to team at orthodoxethos.com or ask at fatherpeterhears.com. So we're not trying to avoid your questions. We want to answer your questions. But we do have this schedule and a program every Thursday where we go to our members and our membership and we ask answer their questions and so join us there join us as a youtube member it's like what is it like dollar two three whatever it is per month i don't know instagram the same thing you can join us at orthodoxethos.com you can join us at patreon.com that's how we're going to publish this book that we're translating that's how we do our work it's one way for you to support us and us to have a q a which is going to be more uh let's say focused on people who really want uh, to be there so Go over there with us. Join us there. We're going to head off right now to there. In about five minutes, we'll we'll come back. Do we have the uh, the link? The link is in the description. Is it not, Justin? The link for the live stream, the question answer live stream, it should be in the description if you want to join us. It's shared in the chat. And uh, we're just grateful that you're here tonight and you joined us. I hope tonight's lecture was really beneficial. I hope... The Father's wisdom has helped you, that we all have and love the Lord, the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man, and the great truths that the Scripture gives us and the Holy Father teaches. So see you soon. God bless. And since all of you who join us, we'll be back in five minutes. Oh,